Think of a really important job, being in charge of a space mission, captaining an oil tanker, President of the United States of America. And the job facing the designers behind the new 205 was more important than that, to Peugeot at least, because we loved our 205s. OK, historically, if you look at it, it wasn't actually until the arrival of the GTI versions that we really took it to heart. But when we did, boy did we, it became an obsession. We love our 205. So the 206 was going to be a very important car and quite a crucial task in redesigning it. That makes it all the more remarkable then that Peugeot took the decision to do it in-house. They didn't commission Pininfarina as they had in the past for the 205 for instance. And the result of that is this. And it's immediately obvious that this is no Pininfarina styled car. Where the 205 was clean, sharp and uncluttered, this is fussy. The front end treatment, though aggressive and good looking, it's got a bit of an overbite and a bit of a saggy bottom lip. And all these lumps and bulges over the car, for instance leading up to the wing mirror, the kicked out sills and around the rear end, and the rear end particularly, well if you ask me, I think it's got a bit of a fat bottom. But there are some nice touches around that lumpy, pumpy body. For instance, this. To protect it in a crash. These rorty, snorty vents might look like they're sucking in great gulps of air to feed a hungry, thrashing engine. But in fact, they're to get air into the cabin to keep it clean and fresh. They also incorporate quite a lot of pollen filters. And they look good too. It seems that historically the UK has been seen pretty much as second best when it comes to manufacturing for Peugeot. This is the first time that a new car is going to start being built in this country at the same time as they start to build it in France. So for the Wrighton plant near Coventry, where they used to build the likes of Humbers and Talbot Solaras and Talbot Horizons and other such delights, it's pretty important particularly when you realise the crucial nature of the 206 to Peugeot, but they didn't win the contract to build this car without a great deal of hard work. Let's talk first of all then about the importance of the car, given the undoubted importance of it to Peugeot. Why did you take the decision to design it in-house and not entrust that to Pininfarina as you have in the past? Well, I think there's been a mixture in the past of, uh, of design uh, activity, and that, that will be the way it continues in future, but this, this car uh, was uh, designed in-house because uh, that was the best design in the, in the, uh, in the contest for it and uh, it uh, seems to be the right thing because of the shape and, s and style of the car. I mean, it seems to have been successful. Given the importance of the car to you, how significant is it that it's going to be built here? Oh, very important. Uh, I mean, we've uh, planned for this for the last three years. We won the decision because of the improvements that we've made in the factory here at Wrighton. We've made tremendous productivity improvements and quality improvements, taking up to the level of the best in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, it was very important that we won the decision to, uh, to build the car. Now that we have won it, uh, it will help us in, in our sales in the UK. There's no question about it. There is still a residue uh, of opinion in uh, people's uh, buying intentions that they want to buy a British-built car. Just talking about the human aspect of this now, you're retired from here, but you still come round and give tours. You, you, you're fascinated to see it and obviously to take us round today. When did you start, when did you first see this plan? And how much is it going to change it now with all the automation, with the £100 million pound that's been put into it? Uh, originally, I came down from uh, I worked in Linwood, uh, which is now gone. I came down in the early 70s, and uh, this was where we built the Avengers, and these horrendous days of strikes and of everything. And now we've got a workforce that's happy in the place. Uh, as you can see, even ex-employees come in and, and help out. So it's a completely different environment, as you can even walk around that new extension. Uh, years ago, windows were at roof level, or even factories nowadays, modern factories don't have windows because people think they shouldn't actually see outside. You know? Whereas now we've got actual windows that operators can have a better environment to look out and work in. You know? And it wasn't simply a case of the contract to build it being given to you here, was it? How does that work? It, there was a lot of heartache. The, we had a director come in from France and decided that if you're doing continuous improvement, which we were doing, he said, as, as long as the rest of the industry are doing continuous improvement, then you actually don't improve. You know, comparative to everybody else and to actually get results you actually have to do and he introduced a lot of the, the, the double sh day shift rather than a day shift and night shift so you get flexibility for a third shift which is easy so he actually introduced an awful lot of cost savings and everything else everything should be in the right place at the right time 
and uh, this is why we've got investment now, because we're actually very competitive. I mean, years ago we didn't have the robots, it was all manual operations and uh, the consistency of well, position of wells was when it's manual is not very accurate. Uh, yeah, yeah, you would have the right number of spots but maybe not the right number of exact spaces, uh, whereas nowadays the robots actually will put a spot well in the exact same space every time. We have now have laser checking equipment, like 20 seconds to check a full body shell. Uh, years ago it was like two and a half shifts, two and a half shifts to, to actually check a, a body shell. So nowadays, and we were building at three and a half thousand, whereas now we'll be able to check every body shell dimensionally. We'll find out whether tooling's wearing, whether there's any deviation at all, very, very quickly now. I was interested to see one load of guys tearing cars to bits. What happens there? Uh, we actually physically dismantle uh, complete body shells, complete major uh, sub-assemblies, and basically what we're checking is the, the weld strength. We're actually looking at the condition of the weld because a weld is actually, should fuse on. So when you actually rip it apart, you should actually have a hole in one side and a slug of metal on the other side. And basically we do, we do that for every major sub-assembly. And the painting processes now in themselves are incredibly complex. They are. They're all done by... Uh, I mean, it's, it's, there's very little waste in paint nowadays, whereas before we used to have all manual spraying and there's a lot of overspray, and you, you actually got that in the vehicle itself, whereas nowadays it's all uh, airless uh, guns we use. We also use uh, we paint in the, in the body shell. One's positive charge, one's negative charge, so there's very little waste of paint at all. I drove the 1.4 and 1.6 litre petrol versions. The 1.4 was definitely the weaker of the two, in fact it felt decidedly feeble. There was the mid-range there, but in all honesty it feels more like a 1.2. The 1.6 was stronger with again more mid-range, it is an 8 valve, quite a drivable engine and quite useful around town, but certainly not something you'd ever expect to press on with and certainly not something that is ever going to rev past about 4,500. The interior feels pretty well put together, it's all quite substantial in here, it's certainly not rattly and tinny like some French cars of the past in this class. And in this, the LX version, it's quite highly specified as well. We've got air conditioning, controls for the electric front windows, and a rather natty control behind the steering wheel for controlling your stereo volume and channel. But, and it is quite a big but, and I don't understand this, the whole thing appears to be afflicted with some unfortunate skin complaint. It's got this flaky, crinkle, knobbly finish. It goes everywhere, on the steering wheel, on the steering column, and I don't like it. It's like sitting on an elephant. It's like elephant skin. Why? The 205 was the epitome of French motoring. That kind of charming but unassuming, rugged utilitarianism, almost an agricultural prospect. And this doesn't have any of that. It's a much more finished car. It is a bigger car. It feels bigger and it actually is bigger. It's quite a lot heavier as well. So over the bumps, the suspension will iron out and soak up a lot more of the uh, indentations and bumps in the road. It feels like you are driving a car a class larger. The engines are available. There's a 1.1, a 1.4 and a 1.6 petrol and this, the diesel. All the petrol engines are pretty unassuming, pretty unremarkable. They're eight valve, there's no multi-valve configurations, there's nothing particularly exciting about them. That said, there's nothing wrong with them, but you certainly are going to leap out of the 1.4 um, and imagine, great, here's something really special. There's plenty of mid-range torque, as you'd expect from a small capacity uh, eight valve petrol engine. The diesel, as you'd expect from Peugeot, is quite a reasonable thing, but again, nothing desperately exciting. And overall, as a drive, there's nothing desperately exciting. It handles reasonably well, it goes to the corners quite nicely. If anything, it tends to drop off as you push it in terms of speed, but then these are not going to be thrashed. They're not boy racers. In all, though some may bill it as the replacement for the 205, that's not particularly fair. The 206 is a very different car. It's bigger, it's more refined, and in marketing speak, it's a more mature product. But then, if you look at the Peugeot range, it's a very different thing from what it was when the 205 was first brought out all those years ago. 
It's not a bad car, but it's never going to be as exciting and as full of flair as the 205. But then, life isn't anymore, is it?